And I am back with Tim Crawford once again. And guess what, folks? We're, we're shifting in a different direction. We're going to actually talk about next-gen analyst relations for a few minutes. And some of you in the chat are going to be like, well, that's not as relevant to me. Uh, but in fact, what we're really talking about here is how to have more open conversations across the so-called ecosystems or communities or whatever you want to call them that are more beneficial to everyone doing a better job and delivering better projects. That's how I see it. And, and I do think that analysts can play an important role in that. And I've had an evolution across to Genomica where more and more in the last number of six, seven years, been more formalizing the analyst thing and going to a ton of analyst events. And, you know, so I come at it from a different direction and I always kind of end up meeting other outliers and independent voices, a number of really great ones in this chat today, by the way. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of how Tim and I met, but I wrote uh, a piece a while back on next gen analyst relations and what would it look like. And the, the piece was kind of a combination of a number of factors. I kind of have a 12 point framework that Tim has promised me someday he will riff on formally in a blog, which would be awesome. But in the meantime, I think the piece kind of struck a chord because you were planning a very similar type of post, I think, in some ways. And perhaps yeah. what you and I have in common in all of that are a couple things. I mean, I think one core thing about my post was that we seem to lose track of the fact that aren't we really trying to serve the customer? Um, and if we're really trying to serve the customer, then doesn't that change a whole lot in terms of what analyst, analyst relations should even look like? So that was one of my points. And the next point was just things around how the speed of today's business environment doesn't lend itself well to a lot of the practices of old, which have to do with, oh, I released this quadrant or this trapezoid once a year. And then you know, we meet once a year and we have a day long thing or whatever. And it's like, come on, man. I mean, things are moving fast right now. And, and I need like a continued dialogue to help me do my job better. And so those were, I think if I had to pick from the 12, those were a couple of my key points, but I want to really open the floor to you in terms of not just my piece, of course, but just in general, because you've had an interesting experience as well, coming into this so-called analyst role and analyst events from a different perspective. And what has that been like for you? And kind of what do you want to say about that? Yeah, thanks, John. And uh, thanks for everyone that is participating in the discussion. I think we, and we need to have more of this, right? So just to set the stage so everyone understands, I'm a former CIO coming into analyst relations. And so what that means is I'm not a career analyst. I don't know how the traditional analyst model worked. I do have some inklings of it now, but I, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in that. But to your point about customer centricity and customer focus, I come from that customer focus when I'm coming into these analyst summits and discussions with vendors. And I got to say, most of the conversations, it's very vendor centric and it's very industry centric, meaning how do I compare against my competition? But what's lost in that conversation is not just the perception of what they think the customer is doing, but the actual domain experience. And this is one of the one of the items that that's kind of in my list, and I've got a few that I'll highlight. But many analysts don't necessarily have domain experience in the areas that they're covering. So that's one piece that I find is a disconnect. But you know, we have to understand analyst relations and industry analysts are another um, another channel for a vendor to influence customers, to communicate with customers. Just like you've got partners, you've got sales organizations, you've got analyst relations. And so I think this is one piece. And Thomas, to your point about being external mouthpieces, I want to talk about that. So hold that thought for, for just a quick second. So I think this domain experience piece is, is something we have to get back to. The other piece is we've spent a lot of time focusing on specific verticals, right? You've got analysts that I focus on this particular technology, but customers aren't looking for this particular technology anymore. They're looking more horizontal. Whether they say it or not, they are. They're looking for something, but they're looking for the adjacencies that go with it, or they're looking for the platform. So take, take a big product like an SAP, right? They might be looking for one particular product, maybe a couple, but at the end of the day, they're going to try and, and look at the other pieces too. And so 
how do you start to bring that together? And I think this vertical versus horizontal approach is something else that has to change. The other, th the other thing I was, you know, kind of to Thomas's point about being external mouthpieces, there's a conflation that that's uh, coming back um, or coming into the the mix, which is the difference between analysts and influencers. And so I think the question is, the question should be, what are you first and foremost? Are you an analyst that has domain experience and therefore could have could have influence over customers? Or are you an influencer that can influence customers? And so it's important to understand those dynamics because those are not the same. Those are absolutely not the same. This is an interesting comment by Jason. John, perhaps analysts need to be more closely aligned with customers and user groups of the vendor partner solutions. And Jason, I would agree with that. And, and one thing I will tell you is that you can't force analysts to adopt the kinds of mindsets that, that Tim and I are talking about today. And unfortunately, my experience has been that a lot of them want to stay in whatever their lane is. I'm actually really shocked sometimes with some of my analyst colleagues that don't even want to make it out on the show floor and talk to customers informally yeah. because they, they just want to file whatever information they need on product updates and roadmaps and move on. Um, but I will tell you that I've gotten frustrated with vendors on this point because I've written a lot of articles around this topic. And one of the things I keep pushing vendors on is, why aren't you much more creative in terms of these kinds of interactions? So for example, a lot of customers have, if vendors have VIP customer events that are also aligned with these conferences and like mix these groups up. Mm -hmm. Like they have things to say to each other. They enjoy talking to each other. Like, why don't we make more of these connections? And and so there's just a real difference in philosophy sometimes, but I will tell you that I seek out user groups and seek out customer interactions. And I'm sure, Tim, you do, and you also have that in your, in your client work as well. But if I didn't have that, I don't feel I could do my job credibly, but not totally. everyone agrees with that. To no, I, I, I'll double down on it. Absolutely. And this is the reason why, you know, 50% of the work I do is with customers, 50% is working with customers, predominantly the CIO. That's because having been a former CIO, having worked with, with those folks, I'm also a member of the Wall Street Journal CIO network and a number of other CIO roundtables around the country. Um, I will tell you that that is an incredibly deep and rich source of information around the CIO. Now, there are some other dynamics, so don't, don't like put on your Christmas list or holiday list that that you want to get invited to those because unless you've been a CIO, it's hard to get into those. But I th but your point is still accurate, which is how do I start to get more engaged with customers? And you should actually be pressing vendors at these events to set up those one on ones with customers. Right. Hear it firsthand from them. I'll give you a good example. There was a customer. I'm not. I'm going to leave the vendor out of the mix. That um, there was a customer that went on the main stage. This is a major customer. Every single person listening to this has heard of this company. Every single one, I guarantee you. Even my mother knows this company. So the customer gets up on stage and says, we are all in with this vendor. Great, great, that's good. I meet with them one-on-one -on -one afterwards. And I'm having a conversation and what it came down to, and I was pressing on that, like, what does that really mean all in? Like, does that mean like the product that you're giving to, that you're producing to your customers? Does it mean your internal IT? Like, help me, uh, help me unpack that a bit. And what it came down to was the actual technology that they're using to monitor their products and services that customers engage with them on, that is all in with that particular vendor. They had no plans whatsoever to move any of their IT systems to that vendor. To me, that's not all in, right? Now, that's not to say that it's, that it's bad in terms of the strategy of that customer, right. but it's important to understand the dynamics and the reasons why. And the why is incredibly powerful, but most people don't double click to figure that out. We got some really important comments in the chat I want to take a few minutes on. Um, Josh says, Hey Josh, thanks for putting off your trip. Hopefully you can leave soon. I continually remind AR folks who are too focused on their message that my job is to make their customers successful, not the vendor. Hopefully we have the same goals in mind, but not always, unfortunately. And Josh, I want to hit on this a little bit further because I think one of the areas there that's really key is that 
customer success is a long game, not a short game. Yes. And so one thing that vendors really struggle with sometimes in these gatherings is acknowledging weak points and saying, you know what, you're right. You've pointed an area where we are weak. Let's benchmark this and note this. And next year, we're going to give you a progress report and show you what we've done better. And a lot of times at these gatherings, some of the most like important things happen when folks like yourself, Tim, or Brian Summer did this in an event I was at recently, pulled someone aside and alerted them to a big issue that some customers were having around, in this case, something around cloud provisioning. I don't want to get too mm-hmm. specific. But the point being, like some of that success talk actually comes with a hard edge yep. because it's about taking a, a, a tougher snapshot. So I wanted to call that out because it's not as simple all the time as just like, oh, we're going to be successful. Let's have a success conversation. Sometimes it's actually a hard conversation because you need to shore up a weakness in how you're delivering and fulfilling for customers. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. And let me give you two very quick examples. Number one, I had a CIO that approached me that wanted, again, I'm going to leave the the vendor out of the mix um, because it's frankly not important. It's the gist that's important. CIO reaches out to me. We're interested in this this vendor's uh, next-gen product. But I kind of want to understand, like, what's the maintenance involved with doing that? Like, what am I going to experience? Can I connect with another CIO to have that conversation? I run it through the channels with the vendor. So reach out to the AR team. They run it through the channels. They're like, okay, we got to get sales involved. Totally get it. Totally understand that, right? But they wanted this, the CIO to fill out basically a prospectus of, Tell us the size of your company. What's the market potential? You know, what's the the TAM of it? All of this other crap before they would even make the introduction. And of course, I told the executive, you know, this, I know the CIO, they're going to just blow up and basically go tell you to pound sand, which is exactly what he did. And what I did then is I said, I went back to the vendor. And again, this is a household name, um, went back to the vendor and I said, you know what? Screw you. You screwed this up, and I made the introduction directly between that CIO and a CIO that I knew was a customer of that vendor that could answer those questions. And they recognized that they had screwed up, and this was kind of their process run amok. So that's one example. Second example is a CIO that came to me, a relatively new customer uh, of this vendor, again, household name, vendor, relatively new. They were the darling, um, you know, part of a, pr- a specific program they have for onboarding new customers uh, into their product, really complicated uh, product. And as soon as they signed the contract, they felt like, okay, th- it was crickets. Like nobody's calling us back. Now we're starting to deploy this one major module and we're not getting the the time and attention that we need and nobody's nobody's kind of engaging and now we have to engage one a, a GSI to rewrite an application because we're getting pressured in terms of our internal business processes like we're going to we're going to screw our business and our revenue if we don't go in a different direction quickly and I'm like hold that thought I made a phone call to the executive that it was in charge of that division of the product Within 24 hours, they were on the horn with that CIO, resolved the issue, and moved forward. What's the lesson here? You got to start listening to your customers. And I think for us being analysts, we have got to be listening to those customers too, because we can be a, a direct conduit to address some of these problems. In both of these cases, guess what happened? Both of those prospects and new customer both of them went forward in building the relationship with this major vendor. We're talking tens to hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue over the next couple of years from the point of that particular conversation that would have gone away. And that was resolved. Now, that's not a, hey, look at me. That's not my point of bringing up these examples. But this is the kind of value that we can, we can bring. And then as a follow-up, have the conversation with the vendor around, how can we make sure that we don't do this again? Like, because if I'm seeing it, others are seeing it too, right? And so I think this is where that, that relationship between the vendor and the customer, we've got to do a better job as an analyst persona, if you will, to be able to understand those dynamics and also help kind of grease some of those skids. Indeed. 
Uh, we've got a lot of great comments going in the chat here. I put I plop a bunch of them up on the screen. It has to do with things like uh, where analysts are getting paid from, and you know, having I think the courage to I think challenge vendors is a big theme. Um, I, I did note in my piece uh, that there's a lot of disclosure problems in our industry when it comes to analysts and where they're being funded. Um, so there's many, many obstacles, obviously, in the path of all of this. But yeah. there's, I think, there is a real, there's a real hunger, I think, amongst customers that I talk to for a better integration of these kinds of conversations. And I don't like it when we're stuck in NDA rooms. And then we hop on planes and there's a total disconnect between our NDA discussions and everything that's happening on the ground. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. John, can, can I go to a comment that Brian made? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So Brian made a comment about upsetting um, vendors. And, you know, I think this is, this is part of the problem, right? Is, is that analysts and analyst firms, they kind of over rotate and it becomes very pay to play or to Brian's point, you know, you become dependent on that revenue stream. And so you tend to give them favor and be a little easier on them. And I don't think that does you a service or them a service. And so what I've found is I have very specific business principles that I stand by. And I'm going to tell a vendor exactly what they need to hear. They may not like it. They may not want to hear it, but I'm going to tell them. And what this has meant is there are some vendors that do not like to work with me because I'm not going to sit there and just put their their messaging on blast and and pump it out to my CIO network. I'm not going to do it because I don't believe that. Um, And so you have to decide what your principles are. Now, granted, I will prioritize clients over non-rev clients in terms of my time and and where where I'm going, you know, and and how I'm investing my time. But that's different than pay to play, and that's very different than your point of upsetting a vendor. So I think that the piece is we have to kind of change the culture where vendors have to be open to listening. And there's one vendor in particular that's coming to mind, and quite frankly, it's a vendor that has a very um, a cervic relationship with customers, and you probably know who that is, but they're also not very open to listening to customers and listening to analysts. Um, and a lot of the analysts that work with them, they placate them, right? They, they essentially tell them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. So I think it's important to, to kind of stand by your business principles and get away from that pay to play as much as you can. Indeed. And I, <clears throat> I don't accept the principle that because you're getting paid by, by a vendor that you should roll over for them. And, Agreed. And it, it's actually self-defeating because the vendor has to be successful in the long run. And so you're, you're taking short-term paychecks, but you're, you're losing ground in the long run because that vendor becomes more and more vulnerable the longer you become a mouthpiece for them and not challenge them. And God knows I've lost a lot of commercial relationships over the years for these reasons. And yeah. it, it is what it is. Like, life is too short. The that's hell right. with it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak the truth and that's how it goes. Yeah, but here's the thing, John. You sleep at night because you know what? You did the right thing. And if you're doing it for the benefit of the customer first and going back to the, the I think it was a comment that was made or maybe it was a comment you had made, is if you are working for the customer first and foremost, which is what I do. I'm coming in with that CIO mentality, like that customer first mentality. If you're coming in with that perspective, first and foremost, the vendor is going to appreciate that. They're going to gain value from that. And you're going to orient yourself in the right way. And if you run across a vendor that doesn't appreciate that, well, guess what? That's not a great relationship to have in the first place. So maybe that's not one that you should be taking their money. So no, it is not. I would focus on, I would focus on those folks that that are really interested in the customer perspective. And I'll be honest, in the relatively short period of time that I've been doing this, again, I'm not a career analyst, but in the short time that I've been doing this, one of the things that I have discovered is over time, more vendors are interested in that perspective and they're becoming more open to hearing what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Let's hope so, because I still have memories of past hangovers from slide deck overdose. <laughs> uh, 
I still have a record, I think 150 slides covered in one hour, uh, be- because this whole thing has implications for whether it's a one-way relationship or a two-way dialogue and all of that, yeah. which I get into on my piece in Next Gen Analyst Relations. Uh, we're going to, um, and you can search that on Diginomica. And like I said, Tim is planning to respond to that piece at some point. Yes. I wanted to hit on, there's a bunch of great comments. Thanks all of you, Tracy. I think that functional domain expertise is what's missing with a lot of analysts and consultants for that matter. Yep. I think that's a really, really important point that when you see that value, it's often coming from that deeper place, right? That's really authentic, right? Which is why it's like certain people in this, in this chat, when they raise their hand, I know they've been doing this for a long time and that's going to come out in the question they're about to ask. And like for you, if you're going to ask a question, it's like, okay, Tim's asking a question. I better like, you know, stop checking my email during the slide deck and like, listen to what Tim has to say. Cause it's going to be good. Cause he's going to talk about what CIOs care about or what customers care about. So I think that domain thing is important. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I mean, another way to gauge that is how much time are you spending with customers versus the vendors? And, you know, Thomas, um, not Thomas, I'm sorry, uh, it was uh, Brian commented on this, right? Analysts that only cover vendors that have a material economic relationship with a given analyst firm or even a given vendor, like they only work with a couple of vendors. I I mean, they're going to be biased, right? And so I think that's the other piece. It, I'm not saying that they have to be biased, but it makes it harder for them not to be biased. And so I do think that, that it's important to understand kind of, again, what are your principles? Who is it that you're ultimately trying to help? And I strongly believe if you help the customer, that will in turn help the vendor. Yeah, so this is interesting, uh, Jason. Do you feel some large vendors and partners are using Vietnam-style communications to manage media narratives and customer perception? Uh, Jason, I'm going to rephrase your question a little bit as to attempt to manage or perhaps in the feudal attempt to manage. Because, Tim, I think that one interesting point here is that some vendors still think they can control the narrative and the conversation about themselves. And and it's futile, right? Yeah. And 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 I'm sorry, but just like like trying to control certain like individuals, whether it's analysts or customers, or try to put a wrap on things, it doesn't work. This stuff always comes out. If you don't think so, just do a search on your favorite vendor and put the word Reddit in the in the search. <laughs> um, you know, or you could do the same thing on Glassdoor or whatever. Yeah. Just quit managing the narrative. It's not going to work. But anyways, Jason still has a question about that. that some, do you think some vendors fall into that trap? Yeah, of course they do. And they're, they're trying to overly control it. You know, that it, they're trying to use analysts as, as influencers, essentially, right? And they want to control the message. They want to control what gets out and what doesn't get out. And the problem with that is that, yes, there, there are analysts that do that as well as influencers that do that. Um, I don't think that's good. I don't think it's healthy. I, in the long run, when you look at what this is intended to ultimately accomplish, which is getting customers engaged, it's not just the the eyeballs on a tweet or a post or whatnot. That's only part of the equation, but that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is getting the customer to say, you know what, I want to know more about that product, or can you t- can you help me address this issue, or I want to buy it. And that's the ultimate test. I think the more you control the narrative, the more you control the conversation, the, it's like, what's the old adage, right? It's like uh, sand in your hand, right? It just falls between your, your fingers, right? The tighter you, you grip it, the more it falls through. And so the other piece to that question is the more experience you have with customers. So take me for example. I have a significant amount of experience and ongoing engagement with customers. That's valuable. Those customers want to hear my voice, not the vendor's voice. They want to hear how I am looking at that particular vendor and what's happening with it. They're not looking for the marketing speak. They're not. They can get that any different way, right? Indeed. And so another thing I... I I said in my post, and we don't have time to get into this discussion today, but I do want to hit on it, which is I made the argument that a good chunk of analyst relations that it, as it exists today, I consider quote unquote legacy, which is obviously a little bit insulting. So sorry about that. 
but it has to do with all the account servicing that is required for the gardeners, IDCs, and foresters of this world in order to potentially remain on their various kinds of, of rankings and ratings and, and quadrants, trapezoids, whatever you want to call them, and, and that I view that model as somewhat archaic and problematic and non-transparent. And I get troubled when I hear people say, I don't know if I should have them as a client or not, because I don't want this to affect how I appear and stuff like that. It's very confusing for them. So, But I'm not stupid enough to say that that's gone or that I, I argue that the influence of that is diminished somewhat from the old days because of the open conversations that happen. But what I'm arguing is that this next-gen concept needs to happen in parallel to that and that it's important and that the kind of conversations we're having today are important. And the reason for that, uh, in my mind, ties in a little bit to Sam's comment here about how baked into reseller contracts, your contract could be canceled if you talk negatively about OEM solutions. And what I find, Tim, is that in a lot of vendor communities, there are certain constituent groups that, that do feel a bit muzzled. And they can't speak as openly on LinkedIn as they might want. Customers even feel that way because they don't want to get in trouble with their own PR and stuff like that. And so that's why I think it's so important to have vocal folks, not just analysts, but anyone who is in the community who can be outspoken. And I've seen that from people that work at big analyst firms also. So I'm not saying that there's, there's some amazing people that work for those firms that are quite vocal in some of our conversations that we have. But the point is we need that because some people in the in these ecosystems just don't have the platform to share what's really going on. Yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. And I think the the other dynamic there and I'm not going to call out the the individual analyst firms cuz I mean there are people there that they struggle if I'm being kind, they struggle. Um and there are people there that I just have mad respect for individual. And so I think th- to your point, though, about each of these comparative grids and whatnot, one of the problems is it's not customer focused. And the methodologies that get used and the way that they approach it is, frankly, it's going, it's going too far afield. Like some of the comparisons just make absolutely no sense. Absolutely no sense. I mean, from a, from a customer standpoint. So, for example, why would you compare? Google Cloud with Salesforce. Why? Why? A customer's not doing a bake-off of Salesforce against Google Cloud, right? They're looking at Azure. They're looking at AWS. They're looking at Google Cloud, right? There, there are certain swim lanes that, that go together. But as we're going through time, these grids and, and comparative reports and whatnot, they're, it's so weird in how they're they're going about it and i think number one it creates a disservice for the customer because it's frankly it's candidly it's misleading it's completely misleading but it also creates a credibility problem for these different firms too that i'm not sure they really understand that i don't know why they're doing this but it creates a credibility problem where people just start to go you know what these are pointless like why would i compare salesforce and google cloud i I'm not going to do that. So what else are they misleading me on? So I think it's important that we we understand the space, we understand what's going on here, and let's have an honest conversation about it. But that also isn't how people make decisions anymore either. Indeed. And uh, yeah, it's not the stone tablets anymore, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and Brian says vendors want control more than just the product narrative, news about activist shareholder issues. Marketed uptake or decline, sales losses, SaaS customer counts, market update of new product lines. Indeed, in fact, a lot of times after news announcements, it feels like we're scurrying around afterwards trying to figure out how many customers are actually using these products, when they're going to come out, and all of that stuff. Um, and you know, to any of you in the chat, I would just say, regardless of whether you're an analyst or not, the more outspoken you can get away with being in your role, the better off your your community and your projects are going to be. But I do respect the fact that some people do feel that they have to be a little quiet, in which case, try to feed the information to user groups and other people who can speak up. And and because I think we get an inaccurate perception because of all the people that do feel like they can't say anything. I, I think that that's absolutely true. But to Brian's point, it, if you look at, if you break apart each of those pieces, which I'm not going to do, but if you look at what people are reporting on, do customers really care about this to the degree that the analysts think they do? Like if you're talking about 
activist shareholder issues. I might care about it, but I'm going to put it in a box, right? Now, the vendor cares about it. Their competition cares about it. But the, does the customer care about it? And so I think, you know, when you start talking about, um, you know, like market uptake or decline, yeah, to some degree, recent sales losses, true SaaS customer counts. I, as a customer or prospect, I kind of don't care, right? I care in generalities, but do I care that, okay, it's up 2% this this quarter year over year versus last quarter, it was up 4% year over year? No. I don't care. Now, if you're an investor, maybe you care about that, but then you should be a financial analyst, not an industry analyst. And I think this is the other piece that, that people just kind of lose track of is who is it that you're working for? Like, what the heck are you doing and who are you working for? And I will tell you this. So this is another, this is going to be a hard one to hear because I also advise financial analysts and I got to say, most of the financial analysts that I work with could run circles around the amount of knowledge and expertise and depth that they have over industry analysts in the same space following the same companies. It's really that dramatic. Interesting. I've had some conversations with some financial analysts recently that gave me a slightly different impression, but 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 it but I will say the knowledge of markets and stuff is like unimpeachable. Uh, for sure. I think sometimes they don't understand some of the nuances of things like how cloud numbers get reported and what what that adoption looks like versus like private cloud and how vendors play games with how those numbers are lumped in and stuff. But that's why I love the dialogue with the financial analysts because they bring something so different to the table, whether that's or not right. whether or not you and I would ag- agree fully on who knows more or what. But but there there's a really interesting thing, which is no coincidence that these groups are kept separate at shows because. Uh, things would really get dangerous if these two groups were were brought together. Um, but I, I can understand why those two groups are not brought together, though, because there's legal implications for, for the financial analysts mingling with people like us that have arguably insider information that that's they don't right. have. So that, that's, a, that's not going to change. They'd never be allowed in, in a lot of ways because the, if you've ever dealt with financial analysts, number one, you have to go through a series of compliance questions as part of every interaction. And most industry analysts would not be able to to get through the question successfully. I mean, the compliance teams would just say, no, nope, can't talk to that person. Well, I'm glad the stream stabilized. That, that makes me happy because, uh, like I said, it's been a little spotty on LinkedIn lately. Uh, we, we should wind down because I'm starting to lose it and we, we've run over. Uh, those of you who know my show know that I don't do the super annoying like, oh, it's the top of the hour. We have to stop because something happens at the top of the hour and we must implode at that point. I like to go until we're out of time, and I'm surprised by how much staying power, frankly, Tim, this topic had amongst the chat. You guys have been absolutely brilliant, and I tried to get to most of your comments, but there were a whole slew of them, Um, and clearly we're going to need to return to this topic on my show in the future because people actually do want to talk about it. So yeah. uh, So did you have anything else? Because I I know you had some different points on that next-gen topic. We have we've covered a lot of ground. I think probably the the best thing to do is after I um, finish my rebuttal to your Excellent. your post. I don't think it's a rebuttal. I think it, frankly, it's just building on on uh, what you've posted, and it's been a long time coming, quite frankly. But I do think we, as a as an industry, if you will, need to have these conversations. AR professionals need to have it. Industry analysts need to have it. Right. So. We need to figure out how to do a better job because ultimately we are all serving the customer. Done. Full stop. Ooh, J- Jason says, uh, bring you back, man. It sounds like some applause right there. Woo-hoo! Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jason. Actually, in the the thing about it for my show is I my show is like a little unhinged, but it's very particular. So the hardest thing is getting someone on the first time. Once they make it on the first time, it's a lot easier to bring them back. So I, th- I think we can do that. And I would definitely... Be glad private cloud is indeed an oxymoron, and that I've had a lot of interesting talks with financial analysts about that very thing. And yes, everyone's comments are a part of this show. That's one of the factors that um, that I really believe in is that the audience here knows way more than we do in a lot of these cases. So it's this group discussion, and I hope people enjoy that vibe. And I will try to keep that going, though I have a lot of travel coming up, so bear with me a little bit on these on these shows. But but thanks a lot, uh, Tim, for 
two excellent discussions and um and yeah i think th- i think this whole thing around around this dialogue with with vendors i think is really really important and for vendors who might feel that it's been a little overly critical i just want to point out that a lot of my pieces argue for what to do about this problem and how to create formats that encourage the kind of dialogue and the customer centric approach that we're describing so i have put forth a lot of creative ideas only a few vendors have really taken me up on it but i can tell you the ones that do are getting results so i do want to say that those that take chances on more like i guess engaging formats and more customer interactions and all that stuff like are getting some good results but and, hey. and there's another piece to that john i mean let's be honest about this there's also the conversations you can have publicly with them and privately of and course. so one thing that i have observed is the private conversations, they tend to be far more candid and they agree with many of the things that you and I have talked about and, yeah. and touched on. Publicly, they have to kind of hedge that a little bit because Indeed. maybe they're, they're senior person or maybe they're just not on the same page yet. A hundred percent. And that that's a process, which is why I kind of describe that you can build towards this and notch wins over time. I'm not arguing for radical change overnight. I'm just saying that that the water's warmer than you think and people like Tim, myself, and a lot of people in the chat you see today are are eager to help with that and get those views across. So uh, definitely look at those comments in the chat. And Sam says you're the most honest and pragmatic CAO Sam oh has gosh. recently met. I'm, I'm, so, I'm getting that one plastered. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you, Sam. Had a blast Very today. Kind. Thanks. Thanks for the fabulous chat, folks. And we'll catch you again soon.